ones who are very good, right? You see, you know, how far are they going to go um, before they hit that wall and say it's not, it's not worth it. You know, of one particular kid who you know, did all of the, the baseball in, in, in high school and it was fun, and you get a, a scholarship for baseball to college and you go and you do it, and eventually you land that coach who's making you practice six days a week and you can't take your classes and uh, you're sitting on the bench anyway and you say, you know, it's, it's not fun anymore. And they walk away from it, um, or, or, or something like that. So, so there's this this piece of if you keep going at it, you're going to contradict me, which is good. Um, if if you keep going at it, um, you're going to hit that point where 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 you don't enjoy it. Um, you're painting a very depressing picture. <laughs> I'm not painting it. No. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's all this opportunity when you learn more to do something with it to, to make it better. Well, well, so, I mean, and he's going to give, and that sort of thing, is it really going to take four weeks for us to read it? He's going to resolve it okay, by saying, <laughs> you know, there's a certain way to learn. You should learn all the time, right? But essentially recognize that there are certain times that you're going to be frustrated in your learning, that you're going to try to solve it, you're not going to be able to solve all of them, right? You shouldn't party all the time because your life's going to be worthless, but if you don't experience life with some <coughs> partying, um, that's going to be bad either. Um, but, but right here he is saying, going full force, right, you see it in PhD candidates also. You know, They finish the stuff and then the last thing they want to do is um, continue actually studying this stuff. <laughs> it is. It is. Are they Right, right. That's new. I mean, that's relatively new thought. Yeah. But if the message is, I they can't do everything with everybody all the time, and then change the concept here, it's not utility. Grant farming. That's yeah. reality. Well, now, isn't there some the thing that wall. is yeah. a relief in that? Well, again, so right now we're not getting a message. We're staying the problem. <laughs> yeah. um, and um, his, his problem is, right, you, you use the word reality. I've experienced reality, and it kind of stinks. Uh, right? Saying that. But that's yeah. bogus. Yeah, right. Um, I, he's going okay, to so come out, and, and he's saying that, there, that one way, I mean, another way to do it, right, is, is there, one way to look at the world, it all seems bad, and eventually, right, you're going to say, well, so how can I adjust the way that I look at the world um, so that I make good use of it? I, he is experiencing the world with the same problems that we experience in the world. Um, and now he's going to, I mean, ha, ha, have we not all experienced a moment where we say, why am I doing this? You get the, the, the PTA parent who's... who's <laughs> going, 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 and then finally somebody calls and says, you know, where are my pictures? You said they were going to be yesterday, and you're like, dude, I'm a, I'm a volunteer. Why am I doing this thing? And, 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 and you want to walk away. Um, he, it is, he is depressed with the world that he lives. I think it's a depression that we all share in some way or another, but those of us who are healthy of mind, we figure out a way to live with the fact that the world doesn't work the way it is. I, and I think that Kohelet is trying to figure out a way to live with the fact that the world doesn't work uh, as it is, and we have to decide whether we like um, what he comes up with. Yeah, One distinction I think I would make, besides the scientific advance issue, is our world is, I think, different than his world in a significant way that you often see referred to as sort of work problems or first world problems. And then we have some real problems as well, many people. So, so you, first, first world problems is versus third world problems. And if he was really oh. King Solomon, perhaps he had fewer of those, he could uh, But, I mean, if you lived in Aleppo now, right, your problems would be very different. If you lived in you know, parts of Africa, if you lived in other places, you wouldn't see the world differently. Our problems, when you talk about a PTA parent, definitely I get that because things like that are definitely annoying. But it's a first world problem. It's a problem of just... Right, well, so that's that's another piece, and we'll, we'll read a little bit of chapter two to get the same piece. Right? But I think the rabbi said it as 
Marbeg Safim, Marbeg Da'agot, right? More money, more problems. Uh, and that's sort of that, right? If you pursue money, it's going to cause. But I would almost say it's less problems. I, I guess that's what I'm saying. It's different. Well, the problems. problems that you have really aren't that important. Right. That if you live in the fourth century BC, if you're under the head money and king, I mean, the problems are a lot worse probably than most of ours in terms of sustenance, in terms of family, in terms of lifespan. Of so when he deals with wealth, and we're going to, you know, be a little bit of the party, he is not imagining the line between have and have not. Right. The only way he talks about wealth is you work your entire life and you don't get to enjoy what you have because you're working all the time. <coughs> um, he doesn't even deal with the, I'm able to find a job so I can support my family, but the guy down the street doesn't even have that. Right. I think it's important to distinguish between human things and technological things. And that's the difference that other people have made reference to. What's here is the human condition. And the human condition is the same whether you have an iPad or or don't. Or right. have a phone or don't. Or have anything. Sure, but it's different if you have food or not. Right? No, it's but not. He's That's not, the human condition. He's not, he's he's not dealing with the line between, st and that way he's a, it's a first world problem as you described. He's not dealing with starvation right. versus He's dealing with, you know, wisdom didn't make me a happier person. Uh, in a second, food doesn't make me a happier person. Wealth doesn't make me a happier person. Sure. Um, that's sort of where he is. And, it, 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 you know, that is a, a human problem. So we have technological, he does it with stuff. Let's, let's just read a little bit of chapter two, because we're not going to be able to only do one chapter we can. Uh, right, so at the end of chapter one, he's tried wisdom, right? Been there, done that, it didn't do anything for me. So if it doesn't pay to get A's, so then what else would you do with power? I tried that also, right? So I tried wisdom, and then he says, Come, I'll treat you to merriment, taste mirth. Right? That too I found um, futile. Of revelry, I said, it's mad. Uh, of merriment, what good is that? I ventured to tempt my flesh with wine and to grasp. Folly, um, right? Sort of. Uh, uh, Seclude is the opposite of. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, is the opposite of, of chokmah. So there's 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 wisdom that you get, like uh, uh, wisdom is CNN, and, 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 and folly is, is animal plant. Is Seclude the same as Seclude? Seclude is the same word as Seclude. So, so see, uh, no, no, uh, yes, no, but here sikhlut is kind of like um, uh, the wasteful things that sort of just, you know, the things that, 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 that <laughs> sikhlut is like daydreaming. That's like what's going on in your head when you should be doing khokma. Um, right? Um, I, I multiplied my possessions. I built myself houses and I planted vineyards. I laid out gardens and roads in which I planted every kind of fruit tree. I constructed pools of water enough to irrigate a forest shooting up with trees. I bought male and female slaves. I acquired stewards. I acquired more cattle, both herds and flocks, than all who were before me in Jerusalem. I further amassed silver and gold and treasures of kings and provinces. I got myself male and female singers, all the luxuries of commoners, coppers and, cop uh, and coppers of them. Thus I gained more wealth than anyone before me in Jerusalem. In addition, my wisdom remained with me. I withheld from my eyes nothing they asked for and denied myself no enjoyment. Rather, I got enjoyment out of all my wealth. And that was all I got out of, of my wealth, right? Um, and then my thoughts turned to all the fortune my hands had built up, to the wealth I had acquired and won. And oh, it was all futile in pursuit of wind. There was no real value uh, under, under the sun. Uh, for what will man be like uh, who succeeded this one who was ruling over what was built long enough long ago. You never heard of best things in life are free. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, I, I saw the, uh, the, the, the water flowing in to create um, loads of trees, forests of trees. Who's, whose mind is traveling with me right now? What do you think of when you think of uh, 
irrigating enough desert to get lots and lots of trees? Uh, Israel. Yeah. Well, so who wants to play Israel with Kohelet? Um, you know, you, we, we often decry sort of the generational shift uh, in, in Israeli um, thinking. You know, here it was, I spent my whole life um, building up the land. Uh, right? what's, what's the generational shift? The one generation um, remembers Israel as the place that you know, could have saved me or my parents from the Holocaust. And, uh, and what, does it, what does it do? And we had nothing and we built it up and we made the desert, the desert bloom. Right? And then you've got this whole kind of generation uh, of Israel. Right? So one way of looking is we take everything for granted. Right? But, but another way of looking at it is looking out and say, okay, we built the country. Okay, the desert, uh, the desert blooms. Okay, um, we've created a wealthy country amidst uh, all kinds of third world uh, nations. Um, and what do we have to show for it? Um, they all love you. Huh? They all love you. <laughs> they, they all love you. Are we all happy? Um, you know, we, you, you go around uh, Tel Aviv, and what are people doing at night? Are they getting this? Did we just read Ari Shavit's book if you haven't, if you haven't read it? You know, it's a, a, a hedonistic... Um, culture, and we haven't been able to do, we've done all these things in the high tech, high tech, and it's all wonderful, and we haven't been able to do the one thing that we set out to do when we started, which was to be a normal nation uh, among the nations. Right? Uh, I'm not saying that as a political uh, statement, I'm saying that as a frame of mind um, that Kohelet is, is imagining um, the way that, that, that we imagine. Um, my experience in Israel, well now it's already going back to 2000, but I was the only time I was ever there um, for Yom Atzmut. Anyone ever been to Israel um, for Yom Atzmut? Yeah. So, so, you know, what, what do you expect to find in Israel on Yom Atzmut? Fourth of July uh, barbecues. That's well, it's turned barbecue. down at the Fourth of July, right? But I expected to find, you know, people dancing the whole way in the streets. You know, everyone wants to talk about how great it is. They lived it. It's their place. It's, you know, my country, it can never lose it. Um, for, for me, it was running around, uh, it was running around Ben Yehuda Street and people were pouring shaving cream on your head. <laughs> <laughs> what, if, what if we turned down to it? And look, look at them, they don't know what to celebrate. They haven't made it to like that next level. In the early days, after 59, 1960, people were dancing in the street. That's exactly that right. Was your and that's sort of the generational thing. And, and that's sort of what Kohelet, right? In the early days of amassing wealth, you're saying, look at me, look at what I've done. In the early days of amassing wisdom, um, look at me, look at how much, how much fun this is. Um, and then, you know, you look at Israel today, or if you want to do it generationally, you look at those millennials and you say, why don't they share the passion? Where has it gone? Um, and I guess that, you know, part of where we're always, you know, he's vexing with, with, with the same problem. How, how do we build it up? I mean, what, what's changed is you say, well, while you were building it and you knew why you were doing this, um, it seemed worth it. Um, but when you say, well, I'm, I'm doing it in order to create a, a, a skyscraper, then you build a skyscraper, but it hasn't made you go ahead. So you, you say, you know, you say, now what? Um, and and that's, that's kind of the world um, that we live in. And, and that's just, in that sense, it's the same as the telephone, right? You know, what is, what is Alexander Graham Bell's solution problem? It's, it's got me that I can't go to the movies without having to check my phone to see if somebody needs me, right? Um. Yeah, one can make the same uh, distinctions between the first generation immigrants to the United States and their work ethic compared to the work ethic of, say, two generations downstream. Uh, it's quite different. I, I know my grandchildren have a quite different work ethic than my parents. Right, right. See? And uh, so, as he says, one generation rolls over to the next, each generation has its own set of standards. Well, and, and the great thing is, right, that um, right, your parents' generation complained about your generation, and you can bet that your kids are going to complain yeah, about uh, their yeah. kids, and in that sense, it's one generation. <laughs> right, what was the Jewish mother's curse? Um, may you have children just <laughs> like you. <laughs> <laughs> I, see that, I see that in my family, exactly. <laughs> so it's easy to describe the problem, um, 
I think that um, there's, there's a piece of, of that problem that we can all relate to. The question becomes um, whether, uh, whether we're, we're satisfied um, with the answers. Let me just look here. So. Yeah, you can look at, uh, at verse uh, 17. We're not going to come back to chapter 2. So we get it here, right? Uh, and so I loathe life. I was distressed by all that goes on under the sun because everything is futile uh, and, and, and pursuit of vain. I loathe all the wealth that I was gaining under the sun, for I shall leave it to the man who will succeed me. And who knows whether he'll be wise or foolish. That's your, your generation thing. You know, I made the money and they're, they're wasting it. Uh, and he'll control all the wealth that I gained by my toil and wisdom under the sun. That too is futile. Uh, and I came to view with despair all the gains I had made. For sometimes a fortune, uh, a person whose fortune was made with wisdom, knowledge, and skill must hand it on to the portion of somebody who didn't work for it, right? That too uh, is futile. That's what they told us in fundraising school, right? <laughs> people don't really want to leave all their money to their kids because they worry about that, right? And people who write estate plans <laughs> and say, how much should I leave to this guy? That's who right. You just should, just who quote them a little bit of chapter two here, and uh, you know. By the way, if you want to leave less to your kids, the synagogue will take. We have a thing called the Jewish Legacy Society, right? Um, and who knows who the next generation leadership in the Jewish in, in the synagogue will be? Right. There's nothing worthwhile for a man but to eat and drink and afford himself enjoyment with his means. Even that I noted comes from God. So we are, right, um, it's, it's eat, drink, and be merry, but he throws in a hint of, but remember, right, you didn't build that, right? Um, all of that uh, also comes from that. So I, I think um, we'll stop there. If anybody, maybe as a, as a conclusion thing, is there anything in here that we read um, that surprises you? Or that you uh, there's there's no talking about companionship. It's all possession. There's no. Well, we will. Personal. We will talk about. I know. We'll get there. But I mean, it's. Um, but but that, is, that is a thing that's missing, right? You, right. You're, you're it's being like missing like right now. You said because you're pursuing the wrong things. Right. right. Anybody else? Parting shots here. Any, any lines? Just ironic that he's reading about all of these. When you read throughout the Tanakh, it's if you do this, all the good things are happening to you. You get all kinds of wealth. So. So the reward that we're offered for, for um, adhering to God's laws is always some kind of wealth. Your fields are going to produce all kinds of things, and your children are going to be great. And he's saying that well, all these things that you're promised for adhering to God's laws are actually pointless. Although the one thing that he does leave out, when he said it's all for me, it's all for me, and that's pointless, he's forgetting in most of the parts where it says you're going to get all this wealth, there's always a part that says, and don't forget to help others. And so he doesn't mention that, at least not. No, no he yeah. doesn't. And, and actually, so, he, he doesn't mention it so well. I mean, we can make ourselves lists of what the parts of his thing that we, that we like and don't like. Um, he does talk about companionship later, but he doesn't much give this message of stop taking and start giving. Right. Maybe that's what he's Which missing. is what we would say. That was my sermon on Shemini and Sarah. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that 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 is that is a. a um, so that's the problem um, of the world, and uh, we'll, we'll try to continue next week.